now I have the honor of introducing our our speaker. Um, let me, before doing that, just introduce Awa Sek, who she's going to be moderating and collecting questions, and we'll ask uh, questions at the end um, <clears throat> to our speaker. And so uh, these should be, or you should have a question box, and so a, a way to submit questions via Zoom. And so please do that. You can do that at any time, the earlier, the better. So as our speaker speaks, then uh, any questions you have, uh, please ask, and she, she will collect that. So Awa Sek is a fifth year uh, PhD student at Harvard University in the economics department. She's in the uh, political economy and government program. Um, she studies Africa and in particular has a focus on kinship uh, relations within Africa and is also interested in uh, migration. And we'll be seeing her or hearing from her later in the, in, in, in the course. Uh, but for now, she'll be moderating our speaker. And our speaker is uh, Dr. Christopher Errett. He's the Distinguished Research Professor in the Department of History at the University of California, Los Angeles. Um, so I first met Dr. Errett, I think it was in 2010 in, in Ghana, um, and heard him talk. And um, of all the historians I know, uh, really of any all the researchers I know, he is the most impressive in terms of um, diversity, uh, in terms of breadth of knowledge. And as you'll see, uh, learning things about Africa, uncovering facts about Africa that you just wouldn't think we could know. And so it's really, really uh, am amazing. If you look at his CV, it's completely consistent with my impression of him. Uh, he's published over 130 articles uh, written about a dozen books. Um, he has a classic publication I read in grad school, it was amazing, called The Civilizations of Africa, A History to 1800, and it's now out and it's is in the second edition. Um, and he has one book which is tentatively titled, it's coming out, so look for this, Ancient Africa in World History, and hopefully he'll uh, give us a bit of uh, information about this. So we're extremely honored to have uh, Dr. Eret talking to us, so thank you very much. I chose a title here that I hope fits in with what we're looking at. I always start out with a sort of crucial first statement when I'm teaching a course on African history. We are, all of us, all human beings, we are Africans. We are Africans because our common human ancestral communities the ancestors of all human beings alive everywhere in the world today, they lived in the eastern parts of Africa, uh, beginning around 70,000 years ago. That's when our, our ancestors reached their full capacities with syntactical language and all the uh, capacities to exchange ideas, to think uh, abstractly that we have today. I start with a comment, of course, uh, that we are all Africans. And that's because, as I've said, our common ancestral communities uh, arose in Eastern Africa. We retained our full modern capacities to think abstractly, uh, to use language in all the complex ways, and so begin to be the human beings that we all are today. And no later than around 50,000 years ago, and some scholars argue even somewhat earlier, uh, our descendants, the, the descendants of those common ancestors of all of us, uh, began to spread out across the rest of the world and also to spread out across the rest of the African continent. And here's a, a key thing to help you help us all understand this. It's not the continent of a single type of people. You know very well dealing with people outside African continent, they somehow have an image of Africans as some single kind of people, uh, no idea of, of how diverse it is. They have an image of, oh, maybe somebody from Southern Nigeria. That's what all Africans look like and are. And of course, that's not true. Africa, and here's the key point on genetic side, it is in fact the most diverse continent of all. The ancestors of all the human beings who moved out from the continent 50,000 years ago and onward, they represent just one subset of that African diversity. 
So, Africa has not been, here's our second key point that I always start out with in teaching. It's not been some place off the, the edge of the world in its own particular place. Uh, those of our ancestors uh, who spread out after 50,000 years ago across the, the whole of the African continent, they didn't become some backward, unchanging people. Uh, and I always also hit on this, this is, a, this is not something that visitors to Africa thought a thousand years ago. It's something that has come to the fore. It's been invented by nonsense, invented by people who 400 years ago and onward have had to justify it to themselves why they were enslaving, mistreating other human beings. So now we have to look back and think about African history in a proper, balanced way and understand it. Africans were participants in, they were contributors to uh, all the main lines, the main directions and developments that lead down to the world we live in today. Now, what I'm going to do is uh, jump ahead slightly here. We're going to not look at 50,000 years down to 10,000 years ago. I'm going to take us on to a major transition that leads into the world we live in today. Between 10,000 and 5,000 BCE, a major world economic transition took place. And this was a transition fundamental to enabling the rest of all the economic developments that have tr transpired since then. What took place was that independently in as many as 11 or 12 separate and widely separated parts of the world, human beings living in those distant areas independently set in motion a transformational shift, a shift that affected the primary economy of human life, the way we get food, the shift from foraging, that is hunting and gathering and so on, to agricultural ways of life. With agriculture, we can on and on increase our productivity in a great variety of ways and we can support larger and larger populations in ways that foraging, that hunting and gathering could not. It freed up human beings to expand their populations to do all the other sorts of changes we've gone through in the last 10,000 years. And Africans in three separate parts of Africa were among those 12 11 or 12 separate regions that brought agriculture into being. So where in Africa? Well, let's start with one case, West Africa, among societies speaking early languages of the Niger Congo language family. And that's certainly something we can look at in the uh, question time is what do we mean when we're saying Niger Congo speaking peoples, peoples who speak languages of that family. Uh, we can identify so people can see what kind of what different societies around Africa come out of that distant historical common ancestry. So in West African case, we have the early crops that you some of them people will well know, uh, pearl millet or, or bulrush millet, uh, most well known. Fonio used to be a very, very important crop, and it's still significant in a lot of areas. The African groundnut, uh, cow peas, black eyed peas, as you know what I say here, as we say in uh, the United States. And then uh, by 5,000, uh, 6,000, 5,000 BC, yams became a very important additional major crop through a, a large area where Niger Congo peoples lived. So where else in Africa though? Well, a second important area was in the eastern parts of the long Sudan belt of Africa. And there it was people who spoke languages of a different family, the Nilo-Saharan family, uh, who began independently to shift to agricultural ways of life. And there's an especially notable crop in world agriculture that comes out of these people's region, and that's sorghum. Uh, they also independently, separately uh, domesticated pearl millet in the eastern areas too, and um, something else 
or uh, melons begin to come, watermelons, one of them, uh, come out of uh, the African contributions to world agriculture. And finally, a third area. In the southern highlands of today's Ethiopia, and the people involved were people who spoke the languages of the Omotic language group. Again, we can do some identification later on if people are interested in being identifying that. And a very different agriculture. The major early crop was the insect plant. Uh, what the key part of the people ate was the corms, the part under the ground of this plant. And it became, it became the, made the kind of uh, sort of basis of the diet that yams would do, for instance, in large areas of West Africa, that state, that inner part of the plant. Now, it's not only that Africans were involved in bringing about this great shift in the primary economy of humankind. Africans living well south in Africa, they were direct contributors as well to the major lines of early human technological invention that lead down to the technological world we live in today. Now, there's several different lines that we can talk about of how uh, technology of early times moves on to the modern times. That one of the very important foundational steps was the development of technologies using heat to transform the chemistry of materials. And the first major really foundational step within that line of technological development was the invention of the first ceramics. Now, it so happens that people in East Asia took this step first of all in history around 20,000 years ago, way off in the farthest, almost farthest East Asia. But it was Africans who independently, uh, eight or 9,000, 10,000 kilometers away, independently invented both the second and the third earliest ceramic technologies in world history. This is something to think about as we look at world history too in general. Human beings independently have come up with many times with the same inventions. Human beings are innovative and creative all around the world, Africa no less than any other part. And it was speakers of early Niger-Congo languages living in today's Mali who created the first African ceramic technology sometime a bit before 9,500 BCE. That's more than 11,500 years ago. And that's 3,000 years before the Middle East had ceramic technology and even longer before this technology reached Europe. So when people say, oh, this people in Europe or somewhere else are all advanced or whatever, hey, go back in history and time and people are moving along and it's other places, places that have been ignored that may be the most important areas. And in this case, in ceramic technology, two different areas of Africa, because also not much later, far east in what's today Sudan, the country of Sudan, speakers of Nile of Saharan languages, as far as we can tell independently, 3000 kilometers away from Mali uh, invented uh, ceramic technology as well. Now, a second line of technology we might call development of mechanical, the mechanical line of invention, where you create uh, instruments and machines that uh, uh, make us more efficient, able to produce products that we couldn't produce before. Well, in all of world history, it now appears that the first invention of the weaving of cotton textiles took place in the eastern part of the Sudan belt of Africa already, in fact, would say before 5000 BCE, in the sixth millennium BCE. Now that's earlier than in India, and that's the country that historians usually mark out as the earliest place of this kind of technology. By the way, people in the Americas independently invented cotton weaving from cotton plants that were native to their part of the world. So this again is one of these kind of key inventions leading down to the uh, modern world that Africans and people in other parts of the world were independent contributors to that. But to look at the African evidence, let me quickly give you an image that you can look at. Uh, this site, this is from a key site near the modern city of Khartoum. 
uh, and here are the images that we might see. On the right, you see two of the spindle whorls. And for thinking about how technology interacts, technological discoveries interact with each other, these spindle whorls were made of ceramic. They're ceramic. They're uh, ceramic spindle whorls. Um, if you know of the maybe rural uh, cotton weaving uh, in West Africa, you might recognize this is the typical shape of spindle whorls in Africa. It's just in West Africa, they tend to be made out of wood, but these very ancient ones were ceramic. The archeologists that first looked at this material said, oh, there must be fishing weights. Uh, these people were not experts in uh, textile archeology. span And so they didn't recognize the two on the right. The one on the left, yeah, it may well have been a fishing weight used to weight the fishing lines of people who lived in this ancient site. Now, that's not the only invention of loom technology in Africa. 2000 kilometers to the west, uh, across the sort of the belt of what's today, oh, uh, southern Nigeria and, and adjacent uh, areas along through in the rainforest and the edges of the rainforest, almost as early, uh, well, we actually we don't have solid evidence of knowing, but we know it's before 3000 BCE. Separately and independently, people in that region created another kind of loom technology. Its product was raffia cloth. And they also used a, a very different kind of uh, a vertical broad loom, quite different from the narrow horizontal loom that's used in West Africa. And, and we, we don't know exactly what the looms look like at Khartoum, but uh, used in West African cotton weaving. So we can see this as quite an independent invention. And it took place before the spread of cotton tech weaving technology from Eastern Sudan all the way to West Africa. So it's an independent development as well. And it's a very great significance for African economic history uh, down to recent centuries, because raffia cloth became a major highly valued product of African commerce. And even you will find uh, standard size of raffia cloth used as money, as currency in parts of the Congo basin in recent centuries. So moving on, uh, it now appears also in the history of metallurgy that Africans had a particularly uh, innovative role. Uh, it, it now appears that in the locations in Western Central African Republic and adjacent areas in Cameroon also, uh, there were people living who invented, now appears the earliest ironworking technology in history as early as 2000 BCE um, and possibly earlier. Uh, 2100, 2200 from some of the sites. Now, what you always learn in history books is about another separate independent invention of ironworking. It took place around sometime a bit before 1500 BCE, just slightly later than the African development. It's the one histories we talk about, it's the one we learn about. It took place in what's today in the modern day country of Turkey. Now, Let's go back to our African history though. From that separate and independent African beginning, iron technology then spread over the course of the next 2000 years across uh, the whole of the rest of the continent south uh, of uh, the Sahara, even to people who were still trying to keep to being hunting and gathering and, and keep from having to do all the labor of farming. Even those people began to use iron technology. And just to give you a sense of, of uh, the high quality of smithing and forging developed in Africa. Here's from uh, the last 2000 years in the Congo Basin, uh, a rather frightening looking throwing knife. It was more used ceremonially than actually in battle. And on the right, you see a flanged weld, welded double bells. Double bell, the African smiths developed the sort of techniques where they could weld in the forge different sheets of iron weld and shape them together to make uh, an object as intricate as this uh, double flange weld, uh, flange welded double bell. This was used typically uh, as a uh, ornament of, of, of an artifact, of, of, of in, implement of chiefship or kingship. So 
A second little thing just to, to mention here to connect up with also, it appears also that iron smelters in East Africa around 2000 years ago, a little bit before, a couple 300 years before, discovered how to construct furnaces that generated such hot temperatures that they could produce carbon steel directly from the smelt. Not quite the quality of carbon steel that people can do today, but nevertheless, carbon steel. Chinese smelters uh -huh. did develop this capacity by around a thousand years ago or so, but Westerners did not gain Europeans this capacity until the adoption of the Bessemer process, not all that much longer than a century and a half ago. So think again, if you think Africans were backward in technological developments. And then still a further important feature that needs to be told when we talk about African history. The Sahara Desert was not a barrier, cutting the rest of Africa off from world history. You have people that think that, oh yes. Remember, they think that Africa is those poor backward Africans and it's all because they were cut off by the Sahara. Well, first off, they weren't backward. We've already covered that. But the Sahara Desert was not a barrier. And we have some notable cases we can talk about. I can begin with agricultural contributions that Africa made to the wider world. At least already between 4,000, starting around 4,000 BCE and onward, into the era from about 3,000 BCE when the Sahara becomes really dry, right on through that period, crops spread across those supposed barriers. At least 11 food crops domestic by Africans, some in West Africa, some in the Eastern Sudan, and uh, even uh, a couple in the Horn of Africa, spread out of Africa and often into distant parts of Eurasia. And this is really maybe the most important. One African domesticated animal, the donkey, it was domesticated in the areas that include Northern Somalia up through the dry Red Sea edges of Eritrea. There, people in those regions domesticated the donkey as a beast of burden to carry loads. And the donkey spread out becoming the animal that enabled the early beginnings of overland long distance transport of goods and people. Very important in the emergence of commerce. Now, of these African contributions, at least four uh, spread, uh, at least four crops uh, spread north to Egypt as early as the fourth millennium, uh, watermelons, uh, bottle gourds, musk melons, cowpeas. And by the third millennium, these crops were beginning to spread much further east, uh, some to the Middle East, but more notably beyond the Middle East. And by the third millennium BCE, even as early as uh, 3000 to uh, 2500 BCE, you have especially the beginning of the spread of crops to the Indian subcontinent. And here's five that became uh, pearl millet, sorghum, the loblob bean, finger millet, uh, which comes from the Ethiopian highlands, and the tamarind, the fruit tree. Crops that became particularly important in enriching the agriculture of the Indian subcontinent. These are crops known from the Harappan civilization of the Indus Valley. And other crops sped still farther east, uh, the country potato, uh, sometimes in older records called the coleus, uh, and the roselle, uh, an important item that uh, these days, for instance, in the West Indies and not just in India, these spread further west to, south, uh, to Southeastern Asia and sorghum, the farthest of all, to Northern China, possibly as early as 3000 BCE, but certainly before 1000. And here's significant, it became not a peripheral crop, but a major crop of North Chinese agriculture, all the way a crop originated in the Eastern Sudan of Africa, all the way to North China. And another primary development we've already, uh, uh, another primary development, it comes out of these developments we've talked about. As early as 1800 to 1000 BCE, Africans in the Sudan belt of Africa had begun to create networks of long distance trade. In case you thought this was something that just began with the Middle East or the Mediterranean. And out of these developments, 
uh, particularly skilled groups of skilled artisans were the producers of goods and the stimulators of these developments, but there began to be people who carried the goods between over the long distances, people who began to take on the roles of merchants, and towns began to emerge as the focal places of manufacturing. We're talking about as much as almost 4,000 years ago in Africa, south of the Sahara. And here are the ruins, just to give you a sense of, of some of the scale of development going on. The ruins of a town from far southern Mauritania, just on the borders of modern day Mali. So it's <clears throat> south of the Sahara. Look at the uh, implications of this has for how we think wrongly and so often in the past thought wrongly about African developments. Now, then between, as we go into the last millennium BCE, between 1,000 and 500, these African networks of commerce began to link up with the other networks of commercial exchange that were emerging in the same era. Mer uh, uh, networks that began to have merchants as the primary carriers in the Eastern Mediterranean particularly, but then spreading out through the Middle East and all the length of the Mediterranean and in the Indian Ocean and the Red Sea regions. And goods began to pass now in this period along several Trans-Saharan trade routes. Uh, the African people, the Garamantes of the Sahara were important uh, linking people, and making those connections. And goods also began to move by land connections to the Red Sea, and then by sea connections uh, reaching that reached back the, the land connections from the Sudan to the Red Sea and from the Horn of Africa, and then via the Red Sea, these trade networks, these trade networks were linked up to the Mediterranean and to the Indian Ocean networks. So to sum up, Africa has not been at all a continent cut off from the rest of humanity, from the rest of our history. It has not been some world of backward lands and backward peoples isolated from world history, unchanging. However much the colonials and the slavers before them might have wished that to be true, might have wished so because they, they could then could uh, rationalize to themselves why they were behaving in such inhumane fashions. Africa instead has been a continent of peoples who actively contributed to, who actively participated in the formative long-term developments of human technological history and human economic history. And there's one closing lesson we need to talk about, I think as well. And it's a lesson of considerable importance, I think for planning and for carrying out investment and development. All across Southern Eurasia in an earlier history, from the farthest parts of East Asia, east to the Iberian Peninsula in the West, uh, westward to the Iberian Peninsula in the West, patriarchal societies who control women's behavior. That's been the norm for thousands of years. These are societies that hinder women's agency and initiative. But these are the societies that people who wrote our early history books came out of, and they presumed this to be the world situation of women in earlier history. But in Africa, south of the Sahara, women have not been necessarily or even usually historically subordinated to men, despite the uh, tendency of the incoming Western colonialists and other outsiders to assume so. So whether in patrilineal or in matrilineal societies, women from far back in African past, they have been and they continue today to be independent social and economic actors in the trades and occupations. And this is important for us when we work and develop and so on, that women carried out, they were the owners of the products of their labor. And as people often know, the major commercial entrepreneurs in recent centuries uh, Southern Nigerian history is uh, important, the Nigerian general, have often been women and not just in Nigeria at all. And these entrepreneurs, this is also true of the trade networks in the middle of the Congo Basin a thousand years ago. And these entrepreneurs have not been just followers of older African religions, but even people who have become Muslims have continued these older African 
uh, a presence of women as important actors in economy and society, and of course, Christian women as well. This is an ancient African background. We have to be aware of it when we deal with development and with investment. So African history is a much more complex story that we could possibly come close to talking, telling about here. Uh, but I, I hope that what I've considered her will widen perspectives and encourage people and will have practical consequences uh, for economic practice. Uh, these books were mentioned at the very beginning, but just to give you a, a picture where you can see the wording for them. Uh, these are books that, um, very much in my much greater depth and greater variety, take you through the whole of the continent of Africa. So um, here at least you can see them as a, something written down. So we learn a lot about how innovative Africa has been throughout history. However, in modern history, when we talk about innovation, we focus on Western countries. So why do you think that is? Has technological innovation slowed down or even stopped in Africa? And if so, why? Or is it just that we're not learning about this newer African innovation? Yeah, well, <clears throat> uh, it's not a simple answer, but there are some maybe simple aspects of it. One, one thing, uh, at least, well, let's see. First off, to get involved in slave trade, uh, turns attention into non-productive aspects of economy, of economic relations. And it takes away from, if you, you, will, if you look at 17th century, for instance, uh, 16th, 17th century trade uh, around the coast of Africa, you discover that before you get to the height of the slave trade eras, there are often African products that come into the trade. For instance, the kingdom of Benin, was a very important producer of cotton textiles. And women, this brings women back into it too, women controlled that product and they were the weavers. So they were the ones benefiting economically from that product. That product got traded. Uh, I'm talking about weaving here of raffia cloth actually, sorry, uh, which involved uh, men, men sometimes as well, but particularly women, but women cotton trade as well. So you have both kinds of weaving in Benin. And uh, the uh, raffia cloths were then high demand down in the direction of modern day Angola. So they were transporting that, that down to sell there. Also, uh, if, if you look at the trade of goods, you'll see cot cotton goods getting traded back and forth between areas. But you also see uh, iron, for instance, we go to what's the Sierra Leone. It's important high quality iron being produced there. You have Portuguese ships coming along. They are taking the goods to Senegal, the, the iron. So you're having iron production still being advanced, African uh, manufacturers, but then the slave trade increasingly displaces this. And the African products begin not to be transferred in the same way back and forth. So they're beginning cut out of the potential lines of economic development that would have been coming out of this. So slave trade is exceedingly important. And it puts people then who are try entrepreneurs, you might call them, who want to live off being able to sell other human beings. And this overshadows the other trade. Those, that's part of it. Um, but uh, in fact, it's a very, very important part. You see what happens to the kingdom of Congo because of this sort of thing, important kingdom, but by the mid 17th century, it's facing inability to be a competitive economic contributor in the ways that would work. But I think you could also have some simplistic things. Uh, there's Rudyard Kipling's old line, we have got the Gatling gun and they have not. Well, 1500, Europeans had guns, weren't no Gatling guns, but they had cannons and guns and the things that gave them with smaller numbers of people able to still win a battle. And I think that's that one little technological advantage was a dangerous and terrible one that caused a lot of what happened afterwards. But slave trade, yeah, that's additionally, uh, it distorts African productivity and what Africans had to give. If you look at how Europeans come in 1500 in their images of Africa, 
they're not like 19th century, late 19th century Europeans images. They don't see Africans as backward or different. But anyway. Yeah. Thank you. That is extremely interesting. Um, I have two related questions on um, basically sources of information. So the first question asks why we do not have much knowledge of Africa during ancient times and during medieval um, times. This is like the first question. And the second question instead uh, relates to um, geographical knowledge. So David Ronkel asks, uh, why we have uh, information that comes from places at similar latitudes, such as Niger, Congo, and Sudan. Does this reflect a better understanding of these arid areas relative to South Africa or Southern Africa, or is there a more structural reason for a concentration of resources in this, of, of historical resources in these areas? So we've got two different, uh, <coughs> can you um, reprise what the first part of this that I need to answer is? Yeah, absolutely. So the first question is more general and just asks why don't we have a lot of historical sources of uh, um, the history of Africa in ancient and medieval times? This is the first yeah. question we can focus on. Well, um, <clears throat> we actually do have an awful lot of historical sources uh, and many, many more to develop, but these are uh, using uh, the history of uh, languages are repositories of knowledge by working our way back in the history of words people used in more ancient times. We learn about their cultural worlds and then we try to uh, correlate that with what we see coming out of the archaeology. And so we can talk a lot about the broad developments of, of human societies in any case. <clears throat> uh, and we do have uh, deep written records uh, for the Horn of Africa. Uh, we have, of course, medieval records, uh, as people would say that term, but uh, going back uh, 1,000, 1,500, 1,300 years uh, in working with uh, large, some large areas of Africa. But then again, so there, there's one difference, uh, and it may have to do with the availability of, of the kind of materials you can develop to even write on without them decaying in a a rainforest tropical environment. Uh, so you don't have people, people, you have cultures that develop very intricate oral preservation of history. And uh, so you have elaborate, uh, wonderful resources of that kind. But of course, uh, those not having been written down in a earlier time, they become uh, only, only work for you the last some hundreds of years usually. Um, now, what makes the difference? Um, so, but we do actually have a lot of the sources. If you go to my, my book on the civilizations of Africa, you will get a, a, an awful lot of detail about the whole continent, including Southern and Central parts. You will find out what's going on. Uh, work of people like Jan Van Sina uh, did uh, tremendous amounts to opening up the Congo Basin world and uh, Southeastern Africa and, and telling us many things that we can learn there. And other people have done Eastern Africa, including me, so that we have a lot of materials to work from. Now, the second uh, sort of question, I, I, what I would say here is there are certain areas, what is crucial to triggering off a lot of what's happened in history is the great transition to food production, to farming producing food in this way, supporting larger populations, uh, more uh, larger communities are but then supportable. And we can move toward development of the kind of political institutions of later times, kingdoms uh, eventually, you know, and the growth of towns and so on. Um, and you need that kind of sort of area. And the areas of invention in Africa are through the, the sort of, you might call the middle belt of the continent as a whole. And just like in Europe, uh, people in the Northern parts of Europe were late to uh, move to the kind of develop, developments we see along the Mediterranean or, or in Sudanic Africa. They're, the African, the Northern Europeans are way behind in these developments, but they're the late areas that farming gets to and supports the larger populations. The spread of agriculture reaches Southern Africa latest and it spreads from West and Eastern Africa southward. So that's, you're going to have a different uh, levels of 
uh, different periods of time that people develop the denser populations and move to those different uh, kinds of political and social and economic organizations. Right. So, Thank and you. if I haven't answered it, please tell me what parts I didn't go to that I should have answered. So. No, 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 you answered perfectly my question. I just have a related question that has been asked uh, several times as well, which is, you partially answered it already, but um, the question is like, why don't we talk a lot about North Africa? Is it because they had a completely separate history in a way, or because we don't have enough evidence to document what was happening in North Africa, or just well, is not the focus of today? No, no, but in my book, I, North Africa gets its covered <laughs> as well. So um, uh, the areas of innovation in Africa, really notable innovation, tend to be through the middle belt of Africa. These are where really notable developments came out of. Uh, Northern Africa has been a uh, receiving area of change. It was, uh, there's a very important settlement coming across that changes the, the languages of the Northern and Saharan Africa around uh, uh, 10,000 years ago. The Amazigh, the Berber languages come out of that background and their languages have a deeper, farther Southern African back, background in the, the Horn of Africa. So there's uh, a, lot of, a lot of history to be told about how people change the economy. Uh, these are people who brought in not farming, but a more productive kind of uh, foraging economy. That is to say, they started to, cult to not cultivate, but to collect wild grains. And this, uh, if you harvest wild grains, it's kind of part way toward harvesting crops. You've moved yourself part way that way. So there's an important history of, of, of uh, food gathering change going on there. Um, the, of course, uh, we always have a lot to talk about more than should be given to Egypt. One of the very prominent things that's come out of the last 30 years of archeological and linguistic work on uh, Egyptian history is that Egypt is very much, uh, its origins very much lie in a culture region that extended from south of Khartoum, north to the middle of modern day Egypt. That's what ancient Egypt came out of. They're part of a common cultural area. People often in the history books say, oh, Egyptians spread their influences to the Sudan. No, actually, most of the archeological evidence shows us the influences are moving from Sudan to Egypt between 4,000 BC, between 5,000 BC and 3,000 BC. It's coming south to north. The Egyptians then have the advantage when the Sahara starts to dry up of more cultivatable land along the Nile River. When you get to Nubia, there, is this, there are the stretches along Dongola that are a little more land, but most of those stretches until you get down to the regions of Khartoum, do not have a lot of farming land. So the Egyptian population grew faster 3000 years ago, and it became the more powerful because of more people, the more powerful armies. And then from that point on, Egypt seemed to be more dominant than the areas to the south. But even that's wrong because in the kingdom of Napata, uh, uh, also in even earlier um, than that, but in Napata and Meroe, we have an equally powerful kingdom that's not Egypt. And anyway, so we need to change. That's something important in African history to understand also, because people have tried to say, oh, Egypt made all these quote, quote unquote civilization things in Africa. All you're doing when you do that is you're taking the European prejudices and you're trying to turn them on your head. We have to free ourselves from the European viewpoints. No, there's not something civilization that Egypt gave to Africa. Africans, including Egyptians, are involved in creating this sort of thing. And it's people from farther south that actually are the predominant influence on Egypt, not the other way around. Anyway, so there's a lot that we have to absorb and change in all of historical thinking to grasp that, that reality. Uh, we've got a long way to go in our teaching of history. Right, so related to this, I think there's a great point by Zainab Sindigawa, who says that the archive material of history in Africa are mostly colonial collections, 
which may not represent the true picture of Africa and Africa. And so she said that she thinks that there's a lot to review. And I ask you, related to the point you just made, if these are the only sources or the main sources, the written sources we have through, of colonial times and history during colonial times, how do we go about changing the narrative and switch it to, towards like the African perspective rather than the colonialist perspective? <laughs> That's how, it's how we tell the story. And it's certainly the way I try to tell the story and what I write. You, you talk, you, you set your feet this is one, this is a nice point that uh, uh, Southern, uh, that Simon, oh, now I'm, I'm getting old, I think. Anyway, um, uh, that uh, was made at a conference that I went to recently. It's really important where you put your feet. People that have written world history still stand with their feet somewhere, maybe in the Middle East, and they look outward at the rest of the world from there. So everything else is like an appendage, even when they don't mean to do it. So you have to stand in Africa and look at how does the rest of the world look if I look outward from Africa? And I'm making what's happening here in this country, that's my, this, this region, that's my focus. And I'm going to talk about what's going on there. And then I can say, oh, how does this relate to things elsewhere? Oh, look, now if I'm standing in Africa, I see things going outward from Africa. If you stand outside, you only see the things going the other way. So it's important where you put your, your uh, intellectually put your feet, so to speak, and how you look. And uh, yeah, that's a long process. Uh, I, in my, the second book of the two that's up there, I'm trying to reach world historians and get them to replant their feet somewhere else. They mean to try it. People that in the world history field want to tell everybody's story but they mess up and don't do it because of the whole history of history writing that we come out of. So yeah, it's where you put your feet maybe. That's a rather too simple sounding, but you have to re rethink and rethink and rethink looking in different directions than you did before. Thank you. Sounds mystical uh, rather than practical, I know, but uh, it is practical. <laughs> It is a complicated question, and it's just like extremely interesting to learn your perspective on this. Uh, another set of questions relates instead to uh, the role of women uh, in the African economy, which is something that you touched on at the end of the lecture. There's uh, one general question, which is how do we like how do we know about the role of women in ancient times in Africa? Where do we learn this information? And another question is. Do you think that this is peculiar of the African continent, like the fact that, like for instance, Matulina, Matulina and Patulina groups, or, or it's not, and it was just uh, diffused everywhere else? And another question that I would add is whether uh, this has any interaction with religious practices or, or, or not at all. Uh, it's probably my... Slippery. Well, we'll have to see. I'll have to, so give me what's the first part of what you're asking there, because I'm, I wasn't taking notes in the rapidity, which we covered things. Yeah, there, so. I can. Yeah, I can ask piece by piece. So the first question is like, how do we learn about the role of women in Af the African economy or like the economy of different African ethnic groups uh, in ancient times? Where do we mm -hmm. get this information? OK, well, <clears throat> people normally uh, they do know about archaeology, so pe people are aware of how we use archaeology. Archaeology, uh, when we go into the sites, discover sites, we have ways, of course, of dating particular old sites where human beings live. We go into those sites and we discover what were the material features we find there. Do we find pottery? We can also uh, the decorations on pottery help us to identify whether we're dealing with one society or another, because different societies will use decor different decorative techniques. And this is the kind of thing we can do with all the material remains that persist. So um, now Africa, um, if you look at Europe, you might have a country like Denmark, and you have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of sites that people have discovered. Well, for the whole of African continent, you have hundreds of sites. 
but we should have thousands upon thousands. So we have an immense, an immense uh, project ahead of human beings to find out all the things that archeology span can tell us. Now, uh, it's not just that you discover that you have a particular group, but the movement of goods or the spread of the cultural complex that you see in a particular archeological site to other areas as time goes on, uh, show you the spread of people with their ideas to other, into other people's lands. And the, then you will see the interaction in the archeology span between the culture already there and the cultural materials that get brought in new. And that allows you to talk about what kind of interactions are taking place among the people. You don't identify individuals, but you make a more democratic history. After all, you make a history about what everybody's doing. And we have dating methods so you can locate uh, fairly closely in time. We can't say someone that died in such and such a year, but we can say in the discovery of a burial that somebody died within uh, such and such a century or two. And then if you have enough different sites, you can pin it down maybe even closer with enough, if you have enough radiocarbon or, or other kinds of dates for the sites. So there's an intricate history that can come out of the archeology. span What people have not used as well, and we still have a problem actually if we'll ever get enough people trained to do all this properly, language is a historical archive. There is a, another book of mine, that I need to mention, it's called History and the Testimony of Language. And it's written for a general audience to see, and it, it aims to tell you, here's what we can do from the evidence of language to figure out the history of the people who spoke that language in the past. So uh, every language is in a sense, a historical archive. It's lexicon, it's vocabulary contains all the words people need to talk about what they do in their lives. It reveals everything about their culture, including uh, things that are not material. So language can lead you into understanding what people's religion was like. We can reconstruct an ancient word for the creator God in the Niger-Congo language family back to at least 6,000 BCE. And this word, comes from a verb, this noun comes from a verb, which means to begin. So we can see that they already, that long ago, had the idea of the creator God that we see in uh, Akan beliefs or in beliefs of people in Central Africa today. We can show from that word something about the intellectual and the religious history of human beings. And there are many other words that we can work with to try to reconstruct. For instance, we can reconstruct a word for the human being back to that period, who was probably the clan sort of priestly, chiefly type of leader, the communicator between the clan and the ancestors. So here we can also reconstruct that kind of religious belief back 6,000, uh, 8,000 years ago, actually. So um, there's a lot we can do from these kind of sources. It will give us appreciation in a democratic sense, as opposed to individual hero leaders or whatever, about what people thought and believed in those earlier times. Um, anyway, uh, there's a so immense amount to do there. Uh, it might be that I could mention what Niger-Congo language family is very widespread today. Uh, Yoruba, uh, Akan, uh, uh, Senufo, uh, uh, people all the way to Senegal and all, and then there was a major spread of Niger Congo people, people who speak the Bantu languages all the way across Central Africa. So that's, that's that family. The Nilo-Saharan family includes the ancient Nubians. It includes the Maasai in uh, East Africa. It includes the Songhai all the way across to the bend of the Niger in West Africa. And Omotic peoples include people like the Kafa and other people across Southern Ethiopia today. So uh, I did want to at least pass that kind of information. Uh, and people from those backgrounds uh, can say, oh yes, I can see where I go back into this creative African history of the earlier times. Anyway. 
All right. Well, thank you very much for answering some of the questions. There were there are like right now 400 other questions that we could ask, but we don't have time. So uh, what we are going to do is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, get the most frequently asked questions and then we're going to answer via email. And now I'm going to leave the floor to Elias. Let me just echo Nathan, Leonard and Stelius here on thanking you big, big time for being with us. Actually, I think in retrospect, we couldn't have dreamt for a better introduction to this course. Yeah. It's a course about how economic has seen African history. And I think it's great. And it adds humility to the economic profession to start with a leading scholar on history and linguistics coming from you. Uh, let me further say that uh, we will touch in the lectures uh, on many of the issues. For example, Nathan will deliver a, a lecture on the slave trades and we will have also a special session on the slave trades, which was the turning point, uh, according to Chris, uh, uh, on this uh, stop or slow down uh, of the innovations. I don't know whether Leonard or Nathan or Steve, you want to add something? I, yeah, I just wanted to thank Dr. Eret. That was uh, amazing. I think there couldn't have been a better uh, start in, uh, to, to our session. So uh, I just really am grateful to, and I learned a lot as I always do anytime I read or hear from you. Yeah, so I echo everyone else. So thanks very much for, for all of us. <laughs> and then for Chris for a wonderful, wonderful introduction to the to African uh, pre-colonial deep history. Our let me also say thank to you. You collected many questions. Thanks a lot for, for sharing your insights. So let me end with a couple of uh, more boring administrative issues. Uh, we received many questions actually seeking uh, Dr. Eret's presentation. This will be uploaded shortly at the course website. In the next seven days, we will also have uh, uh, Chris Eret's uh, uh, lecture uh, uh, available uh, at the course website. Uh, third, we will send uh, uh, some ad more administrative kind of uh, email every Thursday, and we will try to address many of the frequently asked questions uh, in this email. Uh, as Chris uh, very nicely uh, mentioned other work, actually part of the frequently asked questions will refer to other work because uh, we, we should say from the onset that issues like the slave trade, the scramble for Africa, colonization, the independence movements, issues that Nathan, Stegos and Leonard and I will touch upon cannot be addressed obviously in one hour or two hours. So a lot of the frequently asked questions will, will, will contain additional uh, kind of readings, both from economics and also uh, from other uh, areas. So let me again thank you all uh, for being with us today. Uh, we will be in touch and we kindly urge you to keep sending in the dedicated course email uh, 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 comments, uh, keep asking questions. It was great seeing that you all stayed throughout the lecture uh, and we will be back with a detailed questionnaire and, uh, and more details, especially for those who want to receive a letter of uh, uh, that you have participated in this course. Thank you all and see you tomorrow for the special uh, lecture at 3 p.m. Uh, London time, 10 a.m. Eastern American time. Uh, see you all tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>